Welcome to the ACHA Certification Prep video series. My name is Tim Spence, President of BSA Life Structures. I have been an ACHA certificate since 2014 and was elevated to a fellow in the college in 2021. We are going to be talking today about how to prepare for the ACHA exam. Once your application is approved, you can choose to submit your portfolio or complete the exam. And if you're like me, the exam may cause you some consternation. And so that's why we're here today is to work through a plan together of how to approach this exam um, and how to pass it. You also hear advice from ACHA certificate Nicole Morrison, who recently passed the exam. Be great to hear her input. All right, how to prepare for this exam. There are four things that you need to do. The first is that you need to read through the certificate candidate handbook. So the most up-to-date information regarding deadlines, study areas, et cetera. I highly recommend that you take the pra practice exam and we'll have more information on that later on in this presentation. Third, you can connect with an ACHA mentor. If you don't have one already, you can contact the college. I'll be providing contact details later in this presentation as well. And lastly, plan your study schedule well in advance, just like you would a project to realize success. The exam is formatted so that you have 120 questions. 100 of those will be scored, 20 will be non-scored. These are questions that are being tested for future exams. All are multiple choice, you have four options and you're not penalized for guessing. Two and a half hour time limit is what you have for the exam and you're going to want to use all of that time. And you, finally, you will receive a score within 45 days after the testing period ends. The exam content and the types of questions that you will face are around three different categories. First, recall and recognition. These are specific factual information and I would highly recommend that you make flashcards for these type of questions. Secondly, it's applying what you know. It's taking comprehension and interpretation and mani manipulation of the concepts or data that you understand and applying it to basic calculations or finding relationships between some concepts. And lastly, uh, analysis type of questions where you'll integrate a variety of concepts and understand the variables that come together to help you solve the problem. The study content is around four different study areas. The first is forces that drive the business of healthcare. Secondly, programming and planning. Third, design. And fourth, design, uh, delivery and implementation. You can find in the candidate handbook a whole lot more detailed information on this. What you need to know is that 70 of the questions will come from those middle two categories. And every single question on the exam is um, connected to a line on the content outline. So that content outline is the origina originator of all questions. The study resources that you're going to want to become familiar with are the FTI guidelines and this is now broken up into three volumes. Volume one is the hospital, Volume two is outpatient facilities and volume three is residential health. I would highly recommend that you focus mostly on volume one and two. And in doing that, pay attention to the appendix notes throughout the text. Although these are not code, these represent best practice and you will get some questions on these. Secondly, NFPA documents 101, life safety, code handbook and 99, which is health facilities code, 
I'll be honest, I didn't spend a lot of time on 99, but I did focus on 101 and would highly recommend that you look at at least the, the four chapters on there in there that deal with healthcare. And that is 18 and 19, new and existing healthcare occupancies. So that's more acute stuff. And then 20 and 21, which is new and existing outpatient occupancies. If you've been around architecture for a while, you know that ADA is critical and it's extremely critical when it comes to healthcare architecture. You're going to need to know the accessibility code. Also, planning design and, uh, planning design and construction of healthcare facilities. This is a book that is put out by Joint Commission. The wealth of information, including strategies, tools, case studies, and experiences. Some of you have been studying for a while or you've taken the test in the past, and we'd like to give you an opportunity to share with others what you what resources you have found that are helpful. Write in the comments section of this video to share with others. I have one that I would like to share, and that is Building Type Basics for Health Facilities. This is a book that is published by Wiley. Again, it's called Building Type Basics for Healthcare Facilities. I use it every day in the practice of healthcare architecture, and it will help you get ready for this exam as well. So if you're like me, you haven't taken an exam in a while, and so we wanna give you some tips for passing the exam. First, read the question carefully. And as you do so, don't read um, into the question. Answer only what the question is asking. Compare answers and determine what is most probable. I mentioned earlier that there are four options, four multiple choice options. You can pretty quickly narrow that down to at least maybe two or three, and then you're going to have to determine which one is most probable of, of those options. Utilize all of the time that's available to you. Again, that's the two and a half hours that you have. And don't rely solely on your experience. Sometimes experience and what we're supposed to do vary. And so we wanna um, pull that back to the codes that tell us what we have to do. So the area that uh, sometimes gives people a little bit of uh, pause is the forces that influence healthcare. And I wanna give you a little bit more information on that. The best way to get ready for that is to look at current news, articles, journals, and white papers around healthcare. You need to know some facts around healthcare, like virus disease risk levels, trauma classification levels, lab classification levels. And then as we all know that this is a uh, industry that is full of acronyms and full of definitions, and you need to know these medical terms like histology, and acronyms like CT and what they stand for. You also need to know the CMS regulatory accreditation process, things like accountable care, organization, joint commission, what is the role that they play within healthcare, legislation like the Affordable Care Act and what that did to healthcare. Care models or care delivery models like medical homes and patient centered care. And finally, reimbursement, bundled payments, and so forth, what those uh, it entail. When it comes to site and facility master planning, you're going to want to understand the proximity and functional relationships between departments. And sometimes these can come in the form of stacking diagrams like what you see here. I'll give you, for instance, if you ever worked on an emergency department, you know that there is a lot of pushing patients back and forth between the ED and imaging. And so those two departments would want to be proximate and you'll need to know concepts like that. You also need to know FGI sizes and clearances and getting back to that factual recall type of question. These are great for developing flashcards and um, it's looking at these different rooms like operating rooms or pre-op or phase one pack you and understanding the dimensional requirements, the minimal dimensional requirements for those rooms in the form of square footage, in the form of minimal um, dimensions, and then also ratios of types of rooms to, let's say, like in PACU, 
1.5 rooms per OR, understanding those as well. When it comes to uh, understanding zoning and flow, you may get some diagrams that look something like this, where um, it shows you a room. This is an OR. On the right-hand side of the room is the door leading into the OR with the circulating nurse near that door so that he or she can circulate around and get equipment and information into the surgery. Um, you will see the anesthesiologist at the head of the patient and the surgeon um, to, uh, next to the patient, accompanied by the scrub nurse who uh, is in the sterile field as well. So understand how a room works, and this could be a variety of rooms within healthcare. You're also going to want to understand some things like POE, uh, post occupancy evaluation and research. We've seen a lot of movement in the field around research and evidence-based design and concepts like environmental stressors, access to nature, uh, presence of patient options and choices, positive distractions, and social support. These are all important. You'll see an article link there to uh, where you may find some of these type of things. So the benefits of doing a practice exam are number one, that it does highlight the gaps in your knowledge. It helps you determine prior to the test where, what topics you need to concentrate on and maybe dig a little bit deeper. Number two, it gives you the ability to apply your knowledge. You're more likely to retain content if you apply your learning to actual questions. Number three, it demystif demystifies the whole exam, gives you a sense for the layout, question style, and overall ex expectations of the exam. Fourth, it improves your time management allows you to practice managing your time while you're going through exam questions. And lastly, and probably most importantly, is it increases confidence. It develops your confidence and familiarity with the exam so that when you sit on that day to take the exam and you're actually in the testing center and you get that, that just that rush of anxiety, you'll know that you have it and that you are capable of doing it. You can find the practice exam by going to Becoming Certified on the home page. You will then need to click on the exam details, preparation and study. And I recommend that you read this section in detail. And then underneath exam preparation, you'll find the practice exam in the preparation and study references link. The practice exam is hosted by PSI who actually does the, uh, the exam as well. So it's good to get familiar with them. So you will come to the screen first and then you'll just need to click on the link to the practice exam to get started. Finally, I hope this information will help you when preparing for the exam. Remember to use the ACHA certification handbook for the most up-to-date information on applicant questions and requirements and timing. If you have questions, please feel free to contact the college using the number on the left-hand side or the email listed here. You can re use these resources to learn more about ACHA and how to become a certificant, the website and the LinkedIn page. On the right-hand side, look out for our next video on practice exam questions. This is gonna be a good one. You won't miss, want to miss it. And there'll be a couple of these, so tune in. You will now hear advice from ACHA certificate, Nicole Morrison. We wish you good luck and we hope to welcome you into the college very soon. Thanks. Hi, I'm Nicole Morrison. I'm a principal of health sciences at NOR. We are a global architecture and engineering firm. I'm located in Philadelphia, but we have offices across the United States, Canada, the UK, and in the Middle East. I've been with NOR for eight years, and I've been a certificate holder for a little over a year. So to me, it is a big professional achievement. I was very focused on gaining this credential and 
it's a professional milestone that I'm, a, I'm proud to have achieved. It really bolstered my confidence in what, in the expertise that I provide to my clients. And I think it helps clients to understand as well um, the devotion that I have to practicing healthcare architecture. I would advise individuals to start with the FGI guidelines and to go through them um, and kind of identify your strengths and weaknesses. Um, I think it's important to, of course, recognize we all have things we've spent more time on and things that we've spent less time on. So if you can kind of fully summarize the industry, you're, you're looking at the typologies of space in FGI and I think identifying the things that are that you've had less time and experience with is really beneficial. Same thing with NFPA. If you look at recent projects, look at how um, the, the life safety strategy evolved, and then take um, stock of where you need to focus a little time, just things that are harder or not as committed to memory, um, that's really helpful for the exam. I took the sample exam and the thing that it really helped me understand was the breadth of this test, that it's really a um, more experience-based exam. There's not a manual or a guide that will give you all the answers for this, this particular test. So understanding how broad it is and seeing that, experiencing that in a sample test was critical to me kind of understanding how I would study. Um, so I chose to study, like I said, with the FGI guidelines, but then once I had that sample test experience, really think about the process, the constituents, and um, how a project needs to move, ideally, from capital planning through occupancy. And just kind of having that in your mind and, and thinking about those things really helps you to have a clear head on the day of the exam. So like all standardized testing experiences, it's at a testing center. And the most important thing is to stay calm, to kind of zone out, bring your earplugs, plug, <laughs> use their earplugs, whatever you need to do to block out the rest of the world and, um, you know, be ready for the, the test and to have a clear head. So... I felt the test was very much in alignment with the sample and with what I expected. I expected it to be broad. I expected it to be experience-based. And lucky for me, it was a positive outcome. But I can, you know, easily see how it would not be and that it might take a retest. And I would not get discouraged if that is the case because it is atypical from other professional exams that I've taken um, in pursuing architectural licensure or pursuing lead. It's, it's a different test. So that, that being said, I, I think that the preparation was good, but it does um, it, it is largely experience-based. So thinking about where you have gaps and focusing on those things. Um, additionally, some of the test questions are very pointed, um, very statistical. Other things are much more um, relationship or process-driven. Uh, about stakeholder responsibility um, or involvement. So it's, it's very broad. And um, I think keeping that in mind helps you to make sure you're not focusing too much in one area when you're preparing.